So a very warm welcome to the second part of our webinar, Wind Power Markets Around the World. We've already had a very interesting first session, uh, mainly with speakers from Asia and also from Europe. And now we will continue again, starting some European markets and then African and in particular, then also Western on the Western Hemisphere, America. Um, to mention again, this is a public event. So the event is live streamed on Facebook and we will publish also the recordings of this webinar on, in our YouTube channel. So whenever you show your face, when you raise your hand, when you make a statement, then please be aware that this webinar is a public event. Now, I would again like to request everybody who is not supposed or invited to speak to keep muted so that we avoid background noise. Thank you very much for your um, understanding for that. And um, yeah, with this, I think we will start now that second round. And it's my pleasure that we have now uh, speakers. We have small changes in the order of the program. And our first speaker now will be Professor Dr. Tanay Sitki Uyar from Turkey, who is a professor and I understand also today teaching at the university the chairman of Eurosolar Turkey and a board member of the World Wind Energy Association. And Tanay, very warm welcome to you. You will share with us the current situation in Turkey. So if I may hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I think it's clear what... So I will um, mention about the wind power status in Turkey uh, with two sets of data from Turkey's Wind Energy Association. It will be uh, from July up to July 2022. Um, uh, and then uh, a special uh, report I have taken from the state gentlemen for how, what's the situation by the end of uh, December 22. So that's how uh, the uh, development of that's how the development of um, wind power plants in Turkey. We started in 2010. Now it's about uh, 11.6 gigawatts. That's uh, like even under the conditions of not very favorable conditions. I mean, we have some difficulties. Um, some of the vendors uh, were canceled, etc. But still, now we have a good industry, and uh, the World uh, Wind Energy Association, which I was one of the founders, doing uh, really a good work all over. Now they are in Hamburg, uh, Copenhagen, they are in Copenhagen, and they are doing their best to improve the situation in Turkey further. So, all right. Now, uh, these are the uh, wind power plants, uh, which are, I went too fast. Okay, so uh, that is the uh, annual installation of wind power plants in Turkey. In 2021, uh, we see we made about 1.8 uh, gigawatts and uh, and the share of the wind electricity in Turkey in January, it was uh, the total about on the average is 10.7% of all electricity in Turkey are supplied by wind energy. These are the months uh, from January to June, uh, the results of total electricity produced as megawatt hours. And we see January was more than 3 million. So over here, we see the uh, operating wind power plants according to the investors. And uh, we have uh, 
investor like uh, Polat Energy, Borussan, uh, Jurich Demirel Energy, and also we have uh, others, many others, which is about 36% of the total. But we have um, almost 64% uh, by this about 25 um, investors. So when we look the operating wind power plants according to turbine manufacturers, uh, uh, the leader is Nordex, then some General Electric, then Enercon, then Vestas, then Siemens, Gemasa, Luzon, and Gold uh, Wind and Servo. So that's how it is distributed. And we have uh, the regions of Turkey, different regions. Uh, we have Marmara region, Ege region, and other regions. Marmara is leading with uh, uh, five gigawatts. And uh, Ege, uh, Izmir, Western Anatolia is following about 1.7 gigawatts. So uh, we, according to cities in Turkey, the wind power plants mainly located in Izmir and uh, then Balıkesir, Çanakkale, Istanbul, uh, and others. We have uh, the leading cities are Izmir, Balıkesir, and Çanakkale, and Istanbul. So Izmir uh, now becoming an important city because Izmir is selected as one of the 112 cities of European uh, Climate Neutral Cities mission. And uh, there are about now uh, renew uh, uh, total installed power uh, of renewable energy systems is 1,907 megawatts. Uh, the employment is 7,500 from the in, uh, industry. And the total equipment export is now about uh, $500 million. So uh, with these qualities, and already what was done in Izmir, uh, we have applied uh, to be one of the mission cities. And uh, we have started to do this, and kind of we may have making municipalization. We are uh, procuring the electricity of the municipality by the, the municipality company, so that uh, we it becomes less costly. Last year, about 300 million uh, Turkish lira less we paid for the electricity needs of the um, Izmir municipality. So Izmir is really progressing and uh, targeting to be a climate neutral city of Europe by 2030. And we have uh, wind power plants under construction and uh, they are also a good amount and uh, by uh, different months we have a list. Uh, let me go this more in detail. Uh, and the investors wise, uh, wind power plants under construction are, uh, we have uh, the similar uh, same, almost the same companies, but the, the leading one uh, is IDAM Energy, and then Kaba Group, Atasevan Group, Energy Sa, and Kuvanç Energy, these are the five uh, investors uh, leading in the new construction. We also have the turbine manufacturers, which are under construction is again Nordex, Goldwind, General Electric, and Vestas. These are the four companies, turbine manufacturers uh, in the market, and they are leading with the new under construction uh, wind power. Companies. When we look at the regions, again, we see that uh, Marmara region and Central Anatolia region are leading uh, with the new construction. Now, when we come to the cities under construction, uh, uh, we, we see again uh, 
now different cities, uh, uh, other cities uh, became also available because the wind potential in Turkey is really high. And uh, of course, the investors started with the lower potential cities. Um, then we have, um, we have licensed wind power plants also. Uh, they are uh, not too many. And we have, uh, again, licensed wind power plants according to investors. Uh, Exxon Energy, Bolusan, and uh, some other. Exxon Energy is leading in this licensed wind power plants according to investors. And also we have the regions licensed wind power plants. Again, we see Marmara region, Ege region, Western Anatolia and Central Anatolia leading. Uh, again, for the cities licensed wind power plants, uh, Istanbul and uh, Sivas and Balıkesir, Kütahya, uh, other cities of uh, Anatolia are becoming uh, to have more wind turbines as time passes. Of course, there are also three licensed uh, three licensed wind power plants. Uh, there are about uh, 50 pre licensed ones, uh, 50, 54, and they have the pre license and they are applied, applied for the licenses. And the investors uh, for the pre licensed wind turbines, uh, we, we see. Uh, res. these are options, 1,000 megawatt one, for example, and uh, the other one is 800 uh, megawatt. So uh, the options uh, are the ones uh, made and the free license are issued to those people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one is the Yekares, uh, it's like, uh, the, the preliminary first uh, auction, then the auction started to be all over the Anatolia. And uh, when we look at uh, the, the, the uh, pie uh, graphic over here, we see Enarcon, Res Anatolia, Energisa, and Yeka uh, are the in this uh, project. Again, Marmara again power plants, and then the regions like this. And finally, we have uh, we sorry, have, you have five uh, minutes left. No, no, it will be finished. So, as you see, the pre licensed ones in Sanakale, Piklarede, Aydan, Mula. These are all Western Anatolia or Southwestern Anatolia. Okay, now this was uh, what was uh, gathered by the Turkish Wind Energy Association. Now we have a load distribution department of the uh, government. And over there, we have the values for December 2022. And uh, these are the power plant numbers and installed capacity according to primary sources. Primary sources, there's the hydro is the first one, Akarsu, uh, there are 610 uh, hydropower plants with a uh, installed power of 8,296. Uh, the others are uh, with uh, dams, also we have 141. And we have bio biomass, 384 power plants with uh, 2,000 megawatts about. Natural gas is already, uh, we have 345 um, and it is 25,000 uh, megawatt. Solar now became about, uh, we have 9,353. These are the community power type of thing because unlicensed uh, permissions are in, in, uh, allocated and uh, each one is 500 kilowatt or one megawatt. Uh, total, it is 9,400 uh, megawatt in stored power. Uh, imported coal, there are 16 uh, power plants, about 10 gigawatt. Geothermal, 63, 1,500 1, megawatt. 
and wind is 358 power plants we have it's about uh, this is since it is december uh, this 11,360. so that's the general view uh, this is by the sources i mentioned and uh, the type of the the type of the installed uh, power plants uh, they are uh, AUH is the uh, public authority. Some of them are uh, built and transfer options. Some of them are without license, and uh, some of them are with license. The uh, private sector is about 68%, and uh, public is 32%. Uh, this is, again, uh, the amount uh, for each uh, power plant type. Uh, we see over here who owns it, government or private sector, etc. But it's detailed. Uh, and this is the installed capacity development by years uh, in Turkey uh, of all installed power. Now it's 102,000 megawatts. Out of this, about 15, 20% is renewable. Uh, that's the my presentation and the present. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I want to say that we are organizing a <laughs> conference on 4th of May. Uh, this can be reached online or face-to-face -face in Istanbul. Um, uh, Stefan is also one of the speakers and Turkish Indian Energy Association president. And uh, we, have, uh, we are talking about the energy transition issues including climate neutral cities and uh, everybody is invited uh, to register and follow if they have time uh, between those dates thank you very much Stefan. thank you very if much Tanai, for... i would be happy to use. yes for sharing with us the inf the the situation in turkey um the, it is it's actually a, a quite nice success story when it comes to wind power and we see impressive growth rates um and uh, let me also express uh, uh my um that we are really concerned still about the situation in the earthquake areas uh, is is that uh, at the moment um have the the has the government been able to kind of manage well um, under these current circumstances and uh, has energy played a role in the relief activities, if I may ask? This is now, of course, that we have elections in two weeks. Everybody is uh, going around and trying to help people. And also the municipalities in the Western Anatolia, uh, they are building. Uh, and of course, the temporary engineers are providing electricity to those people. So it is. It's, a, it's very, very, very uh, bad situation, but uh, as a nation, we are trying to recover ourselves uh, from this situation. And uh, everybody in general, globally, should understand that we cannot play around with nature. Huh? We need to do everything in harmony with nature. So we should understand this before we die. That's, that's the important thing. Uh, we are trying to uh, inform our people about the energy situation. We know that uh, yes. the pollution and uh, health of the atmosphere is really destroyed by fossil fuel. So transition yes. is important. We'll do thank our you. best. Thank Tanai, you. thank you very much. I know that our next speaker's uh, sp speaker is, is waiting now because she okay. has to go thank to you. another meeting. So thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Tanai, Andrea. and then I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrea Andrea Krai from Canada, who is at the moment in Washington, and will present us the situation in United States and in Canada at once. We're very pleased to have you with us, Andrea. You are also one of the board members since last year of the World Wind Energy Association, and it's a pleasure to work with you. And I know your focus is also on uh, decentralized uh, renewable energy. But now, without further ado, I think. Give you the floor that you can make use of the time that you have thank, thank you for being thank, with yes thank thank you for having me uh good morning and uh good afternoon good evening to everyone um how do i share my screen can i just simply pick my i think it I should work I, because sure you're a co-host yes and um, yes it works if you just go now to the presentation mode and i think it should be 
like this. Oh, slide show. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to provide both the report on Canada and the USA on the latest uh, wind energy statistics. So um, we'll start with Canada. So Canada, it, most of our statistics are produced by the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. They provide um, a background of what has happened over the last year. So uh, this is really that voice and they've since combined uh, the previous Wind Energy Association to, with other smaller associations to become one larger national one that also encompasses solar energy and energy storage solutions. And they really provide that um, the, the, the data that they collect across um, Canada. So this is where a lot of the numbers come from. And Canada and has um, wind and solar energy sectors that grew significantly last year. And Canada's new industry data shows that Canada is just starting to take advantage of its wind and solar energy potentials. So um, it's starting to take off, but it's not happening quite as fast as uh, it should be according to what they have predicted. And it is an important force for job creation, primarily in the construction of new facilities, but also operations and maintenance for those sites. So some facts at a glance, overall wind, solar and energy storage group at 10 and a half percent this year. We have an installed capacity of more than 19 gigawatts of utility scale wind and solar energy and Canada added more than 1.8 gigawatts of new generation capacity last year, which was larger um, than the last year's growth in the previous year, which was just one gigawatt, so we're nearly at two. Canria is forecasting that there's going to be the addition of five gigawatts of wind and two gigawatts of solar in the short term that will be added. So can we, uh, is working hard to obviously unlock these massive opportunities, but um, to see where renewable will go in, in the coming years. So in terms of wind energy development specifically, Canada has 318 wind energy projects that are producing power across the country. It is ranked eighth in the world for installed wind energy capacity as of last year, at the end of last year. The national wind energy capacity grew by 7.1% across Canada in the last year and approximately 7% of Canada's 2020 electricity demand was met by wind and solar in 2021. Some of those statistics um, are not all updated. So that's still based on that number. So in Canada, it's said that wind is a winner from coast to coast to coast. We have three coasts um, in wind energy, which I mentioned as it grew, the new total of more than 15 gigawatts is of installed capacity. Western Canada, I love these analogies, we say blue, <laughs> blue ahead of the pack um, in 2020, and that had to do with the significant growth in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So Alberta added about 605 megawatts, Saskatchewan 377 megawatts, as well as some new wind in Quebec around 24 megawatts. So this year's growth was not on par with what Canria's 2050 vision uh, is, which calls for the addition of 3.8 gigawatts of wind annually. So we're not quite there yet. Um, and across Canada, as of last year, Ontario had more than five and a half gigawatts in total installed wind capacity, powering about 105 million homes. Quebec had four gigawatts. Alberta had a new total of 2.6. Saskatchewan, 804, 804 megawatts of installed capacity. And Nova Scotia, 616. So what does that look like across Canada? I, I think visuals are great. So as you can see here, the stars um, on this, this one is Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan's right here. These were the ones that really added a lot more wind in the last year. We've got a little bit more happening in Quebec. However, Ontario and Quebec remain leaders in um, their, their wind energy. And we also have this map compiled with solar energy uh, across Canada. So we are seeing like smaller increases in some places where um, up in the Yukon, a little bit more solar has come online, things like this across dis different distributed renewables. Um, but generally, wind is still a leader in renewables in Canada. So in terms of growth, Western Canada, as I mentioned, Western Canada accounted for 98% of Canada's total growth last year, with Alberta adding um, 1,391 megawatts and Saskatchewan the 387 megawatts. 
as I mentioned, Quebec added some um, in the east, and we have Ontario and Nova Scotia here in the east. And so Canada's uh, wind and solar energy together accounted for approximately 4,462 person years of employment in last year, and that has grown by 86% this year. It was only uh, 2,400 the previous year. So with this growth rate, um, while there's 1.8 gigawatts significantly larger than the previous year, it does not meet the growth rate called for in the vision, as I mentioned which is a report you can also look at called Powering Canada's Journey, Journey to Net Zero, which states that Canada needs to employ, uh, deploy more than five gigawatts of new wind and solar energy every year to meet its commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So um, I put this quote here, it was um, what the president of Canada said, which was Canada is just starting to take advantage of its wind and solar energy potential. The country needs to do more to unlock the benefits of the enormous opportunities offered by renewable energy. We have massive untapped wind and solar resources and the lowest cost sources of new decarbonized electricity generation available today. So looking at that growth rate, when we look at the vision, Canada, Canada's vision of the 2050 vision is the red line, total renewables being the green line and the projected total, we still have that discrepancy gap um, projected into next year and so on and so forth. So. We'll see what happens. Um, in terms of the short term, as I mentioned, in the next two to uh, so years, we are going to see five gigawatts of wind, two gigawatts of solar, and one gigawatt of storage come online. In terms of the US report now, let's jump across where I am right now. I'm in Washington, DC. Um, so some facts at a glance, the US energy system is rapidly changing. They had a record year here of power generation after 14 years of stagnation. So what does that mean? That was um, power generation was sort of stagnated with demand due to the efficiencies that were found through different things by um, conservation or other efficiencies in equipment that did not require as much demand. However, um, now we're seeing more demand and this advances in technology is actually accelerating more deployment of renewables and expanding markets, such as for electric vehicles and, um, and so on and so forth. So with this heightened geopolitical risks, they've also influenced the energy system, obviously globally. And um, recently new federal legislation authorized historic levels of investment in clean energy, clean technology called the Inflation Reduction Act. It's also known as public law 117-169, and it's the most significant legislation in US history to tackle climate crisis and strengthen American energy security. So in the first half of 2022, 24% of US electricity generation came from renewable resources. We'll take a look right here at the end. Um, comparatively, like if you look across about 10 years, we've seen a little bit of an increase about um, 13 or so percent in over time. So other renewables, solar, wind, hydro are in that mix. So it's slowly increasing. Um, the annual US electricity generating capacity additions in terms of renewables, if you look across the last 22 years, is really interesting. You can see just how much more distributed um, the resources are. We have wind, we have a small portion of nuclear, natural gas, coal, of course, but then you have a huge solar component and battery storage is growing. So it's quite interesting to see what's going to happen. Andrea, in terms you of have five minutes left. Perfect, I'll be done right away. Um, the wind capacity distribution across um, the US as of January, 2023, shows here with the green dots, if you are wondering where all the wind farms are. <laughs> and that's 141.3 gigawatts of wind capacity. And it's about 12% of the US total and developers plan to add that 7.1 gigawatts that I mentioned earlier. In terms of what this looks like, so we see coal dropping by um, source and uh, natural gas still increasing, renewables still wonderfully increasing, and that is mostly due to the wind, while nuclear or petroleum are sort of um, plateaued. So if we break that out into renewables, it's the wind component that's really, really contributing to the increase in renewables, um, as well as solar. So, And clean energy will dominate uh, the U.S. power plant capacity in the coming year. Um, this is uh, the projection for what we see will happen with solar, wind, and battery storage with nuclear as well, and up to 84% of it being utility scale generating capacity. So quite a bit on solar and um, some more here in wind. 
So the forecasted growth is um, 8.6 gigawatts of battery storage capacity, and that would be double the total US battery power capacity and developers plan to add 7.1 gigawatts in 2023. We see stable growth in the US electric power demand through 2050 due to that increasing electrification and ongoing economic growth. And uh, once built these resources, our wind and solar are least cost resources to operate to meet electricity demand because they have zero fuel costs. And compared to the previous year, solar generating capacity has grown about 325% to 1,019% by 2050. That's what's projected. And wind as well capacity grows by 138% to 235%. So renewable generating capacity grows in all regions of the United States, according to the annual energy uh, report cases, and it's supported by growth in installed battery capacity. So thank you so much. Um, this is a pho photograph from Maui, Hawaii wind farm where I was uh, over last summer. Uh, it's a beautiful place to visit if you have the chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's great that you, in your early morning, that you contributed uh, in, in, in that way, showing us what the developments are, not only looking for wind power, uh, and there's been some uh, slowdown, obviously, in particular in the U.S. market in, in wind power in the last year. But when you look at the overall picture that uh, solar energy is now playing a big role in batteries, that was quite, for me, quite new to see that. Then I think we have a, a, a and still an encouraging picture. So it seems that like in the other markets that we've heard before, the direction is right, but uh, still we, we need acceleration. Um, do we have any brief questions for Andrea? If that's not the case, and again, encourage everyone, if you have questions to speaker, then also you make use of the chat uh, here. Um, then Andrea, thank you so much for uh, um, being with us and uh, we wish you a successful stay in Washington and then a, a, a safe trip back to your home in Canada. Thank um, you. Then um, we, we would say goodbye now and go travel right away to our next speaker. Um, and uh, um, Different from what we were originally planning to do, our next speaker will be from Brazil, uh, Dr. Everardo Feitosa, who is uh, the uh, CEO of Eolica, of uh, the uh, an, a developer and uh, one of the founders of our association and also one of the founders of the Brazil Wind Energy Association. Everardo, it's my pleasure to have you with us and the floor is yours. So you're still muted. Please unmute yourself. I will ask you now to unmute. We cannot hear you. You should unmute yourself. Yeah, it's okay Super. now? Yeah, yes, now it's okay. good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's always a pleasure uh, uh, to participate in these events of the World Wind Energy Association. And also a pleasure to see the old friends and colleagues of so many years working in the field of renewable energy. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, here uh, we can see the status of wind energy in, sorry, okay. yeah, the status of wind energy in, in Brazil and uh, uh, two facts uh, we must emphasize here. The first one is that uh, if we are going to the end of the, 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 the slide, we are going to reach 50,000 megawatts in 2030. So this is a, 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 a very good number uh, for the, the wind energy sector. And uh, today, uh, we can see, well, 2022, 2023, uh, something like 25, 26, uh, uh, thousand megawatts of uh, wind install capacity in Brazil. So uh, this nice picture shows the evolution of uh, wind energy in Brazil. And also it shows that in spite of the COVID and the problems that we have in the low uh, uh, economic growth in the country, we are still having a lot of uh, installation of wind energy. In, on the orange uh, uh, color, we can see the projects 
that are in construction at the moment. And uh, so uh, uh, one point that's not showing here is the solar capacity. So as we saw in the last presentation of, uh, 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 from Canada, from Andrea, so we can, at the moment, we have the same amount of wind and solar in Brazil. It's not presented in this graphic, but uh, today we have something like 25,000 megawatt of wind installed capacity in Brazil. And we have also 25,000 megawatts of solar capacity in Brazil. So if this match between solar and wind, half and half, will carry on, we are going to reach 2030 with 100,000 megawatts, 50,000 megawatts of wind and 50,000 megawatts of solar. Can you have the next slide, please? Uh, it's important also to mention that in Brazil, we have two natures of the PPAs. The first one is regulated market, and the second one is the free market. The free market today is the dominant way for uh, the PPAs. So uh, the, the free market for large industries and large commercial stores. Uh, we are having since 2022, the lowest free market electricity price in Brazil. Why? Because all the hydroelectric power plants, in all the hydroelectric power plants, the reservoir are uh, nearly 100% full. <clears throat> in this way, we are having, uh, during the last uh, uh, year, last two years, a reduction of options for regulated market. So this is a, a, a situation that, uh, uh, if we do not have this, the wind capacity will be grow in a, a, a more rapid speed. But this is natural. And of course, we are now working together with the nature, uh, with the match between uh, hydro, that's nearly 70% in Brazil, wind, that's nearly 15, 20% and solar. So we have now a balance and this kind of tendency will uh, uh, grow in the future. That will be a very nice way to see in the future how these three sources of electricity, hydro, wind, and solar, will uh, uh, gain momentum in order to have the majority of electricity in most of the PPAs in the country. Next one, please. So uh, uh, following the uh, last slide, we can see here the behavior of the second largest artificial lake uh, uh, in the world. So the first one is in China, the second one in Brazil. We can see here this picture that's very impressive. So we had in 2009, uh, uh, nearly 100% of the uh, lakes full. And today, nearly 17 years, uh, 20, uh, 22, 2023, again, the same uh, 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 artificial lakes full. So uh, uh, we can also see this kind of sinusoidal behavior. That's very impressive. And again, if we are going to study the sinusoidal behavior of uh, water, sinusoidal behavior of the wind characteristic in solar, we can have uh, a broad range of uh, perspectives and, and research for working in the uh, aim of 100% renewables. So this is very nice graph, of course, this is not the point and the event in which we can go deep to analyze the scientific way of working like hydro, wind and solar, but probably we can make the opportunity to show this later on in another event. Next one, please. Uh, so the consequence of the uh, uh, the hydroelectric power plants full of electricity, we can have here the electric, electricity spot price also. So we are having the lowest electricity price in 10 years. So uh, uh, on the right hand side of the, the slide, uh, it's possible to see this minimum value. Next one, please. Well, in, in order to reach the aim always uh, uh, as the 
uh, uh, mentioned by our association, 100% renewables. Uh, it's important also to mention the tendency in Brazil. So nearly 100% of the wind projects and nearly 100% uh, uh, of solar projects are located in the Northeast region of Brazil. This circle uh, that's mentioned on the uh, uh, red color on the right part. So in, uh, uh, next slide, please. So this, this is a fact of nature. And so the circle is on the top and the consumer, the large industry, the main consumers, the, the states with uh, a, a very high ele electricity consumer are located in the south. So the way to transmit the green electrons from the north to the south has always been a problem in the country. But, uh, but now, next slide, please. So with the new government, we had a plan uh, for this new transmission line map, uh, nearly uh, 10,000 kilometers of new transmission lines with the investment of uh, 10 billion US dollars in new investments. So this will change totally the photograph of renewables energy in Brazil. So uh, as soon as this program, this new investment has been decided, and as soon as we have this new transmission line, we can really see uh, a very uh, good position again in Brazil as a protagonist in the renewable energy sector in the world. Next one, please. And uh, uh, of course, that uh, uh, all that's happened uh, in 2023 is due to a new government that we have in Brazil, only uh, three, four months, with new attitude towards environmental points, uh, new attitudes also, and very sensitive aspects to the Amazon region and priority to renewables. So as I said before, uh, we are again on the right track uh, for be one of the main players in the global wind and solar energy sector in the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Everaldo. I think your last sentence that is really reflecting the truth when we look at the growth rates that aside from China, which has the undisputed number one position globally, um, there is obviously now, again, when we look at the 2022 figures, Brazil as the uh, great uh, newcomer, which has a very stable growth and is now the third largest market for wind turbines. Um, thank you very much also for showing a little bit the bigger picture of how the, the situation on the um, electricity market has been developing and how uh, wind power is also competitive. Um, do we have any questions for Everaldo? Any comments? That seems not the case. So Everaldo, then if I may just ask you a uh, one question as you have a new president, which I think many of us were kind of uh, pleased to see some uh, in terms of uh, environmental concerns to see some change. Mm -hmm. Uh, you indirectly mentioned that, but uh, can I ask you again, uh, will there be changes you expect there is, will be additional momentum for wind power? Uh, yes, on the uh, uh, connection, electrical connection in Brazil. And of course, uh, uh, with the uh, economic growth that we are going to, to have some recovery uh, uh, this year, the bottleneck, bottleneck of the, the connection is always a problem. So solving this problem, this has been a decision taken last month to increase the transmission line. So we only, uh, uh, only we, we need the new transmission line because all the investments are private. Yeah, The good wind and solar resources are there. So with wind, we have the lowest energy prices in Brazil uh, without any subsidy. So only transmission lines. Yes, so this is, I think, another encouraging story that you've told us about Brazil. So in another part of the world where 
uh, things are going into the right direction. Still, of course, we would like to see acceleration, but again, the direction seems to be right. So thank you very much. And uh, I you. know that you have uh, a, a trip, you have a flight, yeah. um, a safe trip, and uh, we wish you, of course, successful development also in the coming months. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Steph. thank you. Thank you. Then with this, which is now, as I just mentioned, the third largest market um, after China and the United States with last year more than four gigawatt of new installations. We're moving back to Europe and coming to what used to be for many years the leader uh, worldwide, and that is Germany. Um, of course, Germany is uh, size-wise not uh, kind of the same dimension like China, United States, or Brazil, but still um, had this in particular 20 years ago an important role. And uh, the, the growth slowed a bit down, but uh, we are now curious to hear what are the re more recent developments. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Stefan Lackmann here, who represents one of our members, uh, Westfalenwind, which is um, uh, a, a developer mainly focusing on a certain region of Germany, and you will report now about the German market development. Stefan, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan, for the invitation. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, you just can. Okay, you perfect. can manage presentation mode, then it'd be perfect. I can, yeah, I think it's working. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's now presenters so, mode, but that happens okay. obviously sometimes. Okay. Well, I, I, if it's okay, I leave it like this. Yeah, maybe um, make it just a bit bigger than the slides. Or how do I switch to the? Yeah, at the bottom, this percent. This you one. Sixty-six percent. No, next to it. Uh, uh, yeah, just not too big, otherwise we don't see. Okay, like this. I think that should be fine. Yes. Well, we see the oh, same cool. that you see. So. Okay. Well, okay. Um, yeah, the uh, the market in uh, Germany, uh, uh, past and current developments. Um, there is a lot going on in Germany at the moment. I can um, uh, <laughs> say from the beginning, uh, it's a lot of new laws, new legislations that are that are coming, and we are uh, every day uh, very busy with uh, trying to do our interpretation of uh, what the legislations mean and uh, how. Of course, we can translate those into uh, the the um, faster development um, of renewables and in, in particular uh, wind power. Um, our company Westfalenwind is from the region uh, of Paderborn in the uh, in the federal district of North Rhine-Westphalia. So we are uh, located in the in the west of Germany. Um, in uh, Paderborn, it's it's um, uh, it's it's a region we are uh, really far ahead of many other regions in Germany. We we launched the uh, actually the the the, uh, the first wind park of Northern Westphalia here in Paderborn already very early in the 1990s, followed by uh, wind parks with public participation. That is something we uh, really put a a strong emphasis on because we believe it's important that that the um, the people living in the area are participating in wind parks, uh, grow with the with with the renewables, and then also develop a, a, a higher acceptance uh, for these developments. Um, we had in uh, already in 1979 the the biggest onshore wind park um, here in in the region of Paderborn. Um, yeah, not only because um, we have very good sites for, for wind power here, but um, uh, also because uh, there were many players who really pushed for these developments. By 2009, we had already quite many actors being uh, active here in the region in the, in the field of wind power. And that's why the company Westfalen Wind was founded um, together with yeah, several uh, people. And by now, today, we have more than 120 employees. And uh, something we're really proud of is that uh, we have more than 150% uh, 
um, of the uh, electricity uh, uh, consumption here is coming from uh, uh, renewables and, and mainly wind power. So our main focus is wind power. We also do solar and um, we also work with some inno innovative um, concepts like uh, installing um, data centers uh, within the wind mills. Um, but very important also is that uh, we have our own electricity consumption uh, uh, distribution. Um, so we are able to, um, since, since already by now 10 years, we are able to provide electricity to people uh, in the region. Uh, that was the idea from the beginning to say, okay, those people who live close to wind parks and look at wind parks also should benefit from it. And um, the, the best and most direct way people can benefit is that they uh, get cheap electricity and they develop an understanding that the cheapest electricity is coming from renewables. So speaking about uh, Germany um, in total, we have today uh, 28,200 installed wind turbines with an um, uh, approximately 56 gigawatts of installed power. Uh, the average wind turbine in Germany has um, roughly two megawatts in nom nominal capacity and a total height of 137 meters and a rotor diameter of 81 meters. But of course, the windmills that we are planning with in new projects uh, are much. Uh, bigger. And that is important because um, Germany is a country with this, which is densely populated and we have limited areas to develop uh, wind parks. Um, so we need to use these areas as, as efficient as possible. And uh, if we use these, uh, so we are also here in the region now about to repower many of the old wind turbines with uh, new and modern um, wind turbines. And so if, if we do that and use these uh, modern um, technology, then we will uh, not see a linear increase in wind power, but an exponential increase, hopefully. This is the development of the installed capacity. We see that there was um, um, in the in the in, in the 2000 um, in the years 2000 around 2000 uh, with the uh, renewable energy law in Germany that promoted uh, the development of renewable energies very much. There was an increase and it slowed down a little bit, bit and then it it increased very strongly. Uh, the peak was in 2017. And then in Germany, uh, a new system was established uh, before there was a fixed um, uh, price uh, per kilowatt hour um, with which the renewables were supported. And then Germany switched into a bidding process. So every year when we have, um, uh, for example, a wind park approved, we need to take part in a, in, a, in a bidding process, in a national bidding process. It's a limited amount of um, um, capacity, so in, uh, counted in megawatts, um, that are um, uh, part of the bidding process. And then we need to uh, go in with a, with a certain price per uh, kilowatt hour and uh, hopefully win a bid. Uh, and that then uh, is, the price we receive as support for 20 years, uh, which is yeah, then the duration of this support for, for one wind park. But that switch uh, um, in 2017 uh, led to a very sharp decrease uh, in the development of the installed capacity because there was uh, obviously some, some um, yeah, hesitation among developers um, and yeah, it, it was a new system, so it, it very much uh, slowed down the, the development. And now we slowly see, see an increase again. Um, yeah, if we look, so this was the, uh, the development in the uh, installed capacity. Now we look at the, uh, at the development of approved wind turbines, and we see that uh, basically, the, the, 
the the key message of this slide is that the approval processes uh, take uh, uh, longer and longer. So while we had um, um, uh, in the period of uh, 2014 to 2016, we had an average per year uh, an, a number of um, uh, around 6,000 wind turbines that were installed every year. It's uh, now only uh, it's it's 2,000 wind turbines less. So there is a, 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 a huge gap. And uh, it, it is very much in line with our observation that the approval processes for um, wind parks in particular are getting, um, uh, are getting worse. Um, yeah, speaking about the, the, the duration, um from from planning to the real realization of the wind park so we in germany we start with a with a survey that takes an entire year a survey of survey of uh, birds and and bats that are flying around in in one region so it takes already a very long time to only do do that then based on that we need to do expert expert reports on uh, nature conservation, but also on other issues that take uh, uh, up to six more months. Then we have an um, an approval process of uh, approximately two years. Here in our federal districts, it's yeah, it's it's approximately two years. In other federal districts, it's it's much longer. Um, the federal district of Hessen, it's it's even uh, thirty eight months. So there is a there is a very big discrepancy between the federal uh, districts in Germany. And these approval processes have uh, public consultation processes um, uh, where people, of course, um, can um, uh, send in objections. And that is um, at times up to 5,000 object, ob objections or more that, that we then have to deal with. You so have five takes, minutes left. Yes, I'm, I'm soon done. And um, and then once you get the approval, um, of course, it takes uh, much more time uh, until a wind park is realized. So in, in average, it's 27 months from approval until the windmill is running if there is not um, a, a lawsuit uh, put on the on the wind park. You can see here, and that illustrates very well the bureaucracy we are dealing with in Germany. This is how we um, uh, what we need to do when we uh, send in an um, application. We basically go to the authority with a small truck uh, with many, many boxes of folders that we have to hand in. And then the authorities have to deal with this uh, big pile of paper. So this is already my last slide. Um, Talking about the objectives of, uh, I mean, we have a, a relatively new federal um, government uh, that set very um, uh, ambitious objectives. They want to um, uh, uh, they want to set two percent of the uh, entire land area for for wind energy uh, until latest the end of uh, twenty thirty two. Um, they want to have 80% of the electricity consumption uh, coming from renewables until um, 2030 with an installed capacity of 110 uh, gigawatts. Um, we have in the bidding process uh, this year uh, uh, almost 13,000 megawatts. Uh, um, um, last year it was it was uh, yeah roughly the half or le less than the half. And it's it's of course much much more uh, than um, than the projects that are currently in in development. And then from twenty four onwards, we have annually ten thousand megawatts in the in the bidding process. Um, so the uh, I think it's uh, in, in in summary in Germany the the policy has really acknowledged that it's very very important to. 
um, put a focus on the development of renewables. Um, they are serious about the development. They put uh, uh, important uh, legislation um, uh, uh, into power. For example, there are ease requirements on nature conservation, on, on repowering uh, and these kind of things. But the implementation of this legislation into the approval processes takes very, very slow we, because we're in Germany dealing with a ter terrible bureaucracy and it takes a long time to really translate this into the, into the um, uh, approval processes. I think that is how you can <laughs> currently uh, summarize the, the situation in Germany. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. I think that was giving a very good overview. And I would just like to refer to one point that you made because it fits to one of our previous speakers from Sweden, um, who also complained about the long uh, permitting and planning processes and the duration of that. And uh, I, I just remember, I just had a look at, because we, we gathered statistics from different parts of the world uh, one and a half years ago, and the average uh, time in... Germany was 70 months for planning and permitting process in total. So obviously the district where you are is doing better. And that again brings me to that point that um, also obviously what you mentioned as the um, community engagement processes which you, are, which you have in place are obviously very helpful because um, the local authorities where you are um, are rather supportive. Is that right? Um, here in the region of Paderborn, yes. I mean, it's processes that are, um, I mean, the, the authorities here have now done it for a long time as well. They are used to these approval processes, but in um, other regions of North Rhine-Westphalia, it, it obviously takes longer. It really depends. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly my point. And it's, and, it's, and it's often really depending on ind individuals. Mm. Um, so you can never, that is our experience, you can never set uh, the rules uh, that clear that every authority has to stick to these rules and uh, and approval processes are, um, are everywhere the same. And um, it, it, it always depends on the individuals and, and what they um, require. Yes, so thank you. Then um, do I see any questions for Stefan? Uh, I don't see that. Then again, thank you very much. And uh, we're also hopeful, of course, that the German market is developing with uh, accelerated uh, deployment rates. Now mm -hmm. let's again leave Europe and we are going now to the African continent. And it's my pleasure that we have uh, Professor Galal Osman with us, who's been the long-term um, president of the Egyptian Wind Energy Association and also one of the founders of our association. And of course, Egypt uh, uh, is one of the pioneers of the African continent, the first African country which installed major wind farms and uh, now also with ambitious plans. And we're looking forward now to hearing from you uh, Galal. I, Galal, I hope that your uh, um, audio connection now works. So it looks now good. And uh, then I would like to hand over to you. Galal, we cannot hear you. You hear me now, okay? Just very little we hear you. Can you speak a bit up? Hello? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you a little bit. So I make it higher. I make it higher. Yes. Okay, my talk today regarding the winter energy in Egypt. And, uh, we have the and, uh, that, I'm afraid that this is not really understandable. Do, do you need to use these earphones or can you try without? Let me just take the, yeah. Hello. Yes, can you speak? Metal. Yes, hello. Yeah, that's better. Okay, please go ahead. <coughs> okay. 
My talk today regarding the complex situation in Egypt. Egypt is considered an oil uh, an, an oil exporting country. So our uh, electrical system is more than 90% fossil fuel and uh, renewable is only 10%. So this is the point. And then with the decarbonization, we are in the point to shift to more renewable, but the economical situation is tough. The local currency has been devaluated twice and there are many projects are in the pipeline. Uh, the first slide, this is the wind farm in, uh, in, in uh, Gulf of Suez with uh, 80, 850 uh, Siemens Gamesa uh, wind turbine. And all of these now are going to be changed to new uh, system. Second slide, I am showing the, uh, the, uh, the, the projects. And this is a governmental report, but unluckily, uh, this is just came out of print and is uh, uh, the Arabic piece, so I'm going to send another one in English. The installed capacity is 13,041 13, uh, 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 megawatt. This is by the governmental item and the private sector, 1,980 uh, 1, megawatt. So all in total about three gigawatt of wind. These are uh, uh, the installed uh, projects, which are solar and wind. Egypt installed the capacity now is 32 megawatt. Uh, this is uh, the maximum load. Out of it, we have six gigawatt of uh, hydro uh, from the high dam and three, and three gigawatt from wind and solar. Is this, is am I still visible or how does it look? I lost the. Stephen. Uh, we can hear you, Galen. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going on. This is installed the capacity in Egypt uh, as. Uh, uh, Half of 50% of the renewable is coming by hydro. We are having a problem with uh, Ethiopia Renaissance Dam, with the problem of water. Siemens gas turbine and for plants to into and the we are still considering that we have nature yes. Now, after the war between Ukraine and Russia, uh, we are looking now to improve the economic situation by supporting nature again. More wind project and solar so that we save some uh, natural gas to be exported to uh, the clients. We have two uh, liquefaction plants, one in Damietta and one in Etco, with the capacity, but now most of them are being used now by natural gas belonging to Israel. The point is not only to generate electricity, uh, uh, because with renewable, you need to store, to make a storage. So now we are shifting now to green hydrogen. During uh, the last week in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, 21 investors signed memos of understanding to try to go to produce uh, ammonia and methanol and the green uh, hydrogen, uh, mainly for uh, uh, shipping for the ships, so that in the ports to have green fuel for, uh, for ships and uh, to export it as ammonia for fertilizer. In a heavily, heavily populated country like us with 120 million and most of desert, then food is another part of the dilemma, which we call it uh, energy, water, and food complex. Uh, so, uh, uh, so a renewable energy from wind and solar to produce green hydrogen and then ammonia 
to, to make fertilizer for the desert lands. This will be the trend now. Uh, there are many ambitious plans in MENA region to export during this time to Europe and having local electrolyzer industry and exporting uh, wind and solar energy to Europe as we are the, the southern neighbor from many uh, countries where many pioneers are now in the region like Oman with three, with three ports to export hydrogen. And of course, the giant Saudi Arabia with the giant project of Neom, of also to produce ammonia so to be in for export with the Giga project's capacity. And then Egypt is trying to find its way. Repowering is being applied for the old power plants because we, have, we, are, we were having our wind atlas under uh, 50 or 60 meter. The new trend now is to go for bigger wind turbine and larger uh, swept uh, blade area. So now new uh, measurements for wind on the 150 meter height so that to go for the new places. And this allowed the, the bureaucracy of military item to allow uh, uh, going to higher, higher, higher heights. So again, uh, bureaucracy of having a system and even I was getting complaints from Vesta's people regarding moving blades, long blades across roads and different places. These are the day and the day problem. Regarding the hydro, the renewable energy Egypt, we have an, a, a, a symphony of hydro, 47%, wind, 27%, and solar, uh, 27%. So it is, so half the renewable are coming from wind and solar, and solar mainly PV. There are plans now to go for 32% renewable. And these are the figures, these are the speculation, but I don't know whether they're going to be realized and when uh, and uh, uh, nuclear power plants are in the pipeline uh, with 30% out of the total, but the country is being dominated unluckily by thermal power plants, long-term uh, power plants. When the Atlas, the new one, the Atlas should be done because the, the old wind the Atlas were on 50% and in all the places around the Gulf of, of Suez Canal. Now new areas are in the south of Egypt in, uh, in near Luxor, where west of the Nile, there are good wind regime and then the oasis to make this one. Uh, regarding the projects, there are different locations. One in Zafarana, 545 megawatt, west of Bakr around the Suez Canal, and these are uh, the situation is as followed. Already implemented 1,637 megawatt. Under construction, 252. And under development on, on the horizon, another 2,800 megawatt. Uh, all of them around the Gulf of Suez. Because Gulf of Suez is the wind mine of the country. It, between both sides, whether Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Gal, you have five minutes left. Okay, I should wrap up, but I should mention that uh, we have another problem which was mentioned in Germany regarding uh, bird migration. Uh, Egypt is the corridor for, for bird migration, and then there must be some environmental measures for that. So bird watching, and they try to not to make uh, suicide for the birds while crossing. Then there is a radar system to send to sense when the birds are coming, and this radar make early warning for uh, when they are 12 kilometers far before they arrive to the wind turbine, and then stop the wind turbine during the passing of the of this one. This has been uh, the study because many of the speeches of, of the wind turbine, they are, uh, and then we have uh, sand storms and we are afraid from that they are, they are having problems 
with uh, with the wind turbine. There are 13 observatory points and two radar points so that for the bird migration. Uh, the last point is green hydrogen. We know that uh, wind energy is intermittent. So as a storage, you are looking now to make testing of 100 megawatt in uh, the uh, uh, economical zone of Suez Canal and try to make green hydrogen and ammonia and methanol as fuel for the green corridor coming from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean for shipping uh, for ship. And I thank you for that. And it might be my pleasure to join the, the group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galal. It's good to hear directly from uh, Egypt and uh, hear about that there are plans. And of course, we hope that the Egyptian government, especially after hosting the COP, uh, the, the UN Climate Change Conference, uh, is, is putting more efforts now, as it was one of the pioneers uh, in wind power, as I'm already mentioned, in the Maghreb region and African continent. Do we have any questions for Galal? So that seems not the case. So again, thank you so much. And then I thank would like you. to go to our next speaker. And uh, we stay in the region. In the, We travel a little bit to the west, uh, to Morocco. And uh, our next speaker is Khalid Benhamou from Sahara Wind, who is also one of our board members and uh, one of the persons who's been very actively promoting wind power in Morocco and beyond. It's my pleasure to welcome you. And uh, now we look forward to hearing from Morocco, who shortly after Egypt also joined the race of who is the leader in North Africa. Alit, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I just want to ensure that you are seeing my slides appropriately. Yes, it looks okay. well and uh, okay. presentation more. Yes, so it's a pleasure to be following uh, suit uh, after uh, Galal and uh, Egypt's uh, pioneering uh, work on the wind energy early in the late, uh, uh, early 90s, actually. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to present here today is essentially the status of what's going on in the western part of Africa, northwestern part, namely the Maghreb region, starting with uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Mauritania, and I'll finish with Morocco. And uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna present uh, essentially the situation in Tunisia, uh, which as you can see is not very dynamic. Uh, there is about 243 megawatts installed and they have been installed for a while already since 2013. Uh, they are projects that are envisioned, but uh, visibility on their uh, construction or evidence on their construction has not yet been provided. It's probably due to the uh, country's uh, current uh, state of uh, uh, political uh, uh, turmoil. And uh, the investment, obviously, uh, when talking about wind energy and the uh, uh, renewables in particular, you need visibility and, uh, and you need to attract also foreign investments because the, the country's economies, mostly Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, and to some extent, uh, Algeria as well, are, are fairly limited. And so the idea here is uh, to try and support uh, sound legal frameworks, which uh, will enable uh, key investments to be made in the sector. So we look to hear more from uh, Tunisia's uh, wind energy sector. But for now, uh, I must admit that uh, it has not been very, uh, very, very interest. I mean, very appealing. Uh, and so that's the status that we have in Tunisia. In Algeria, I would say it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, only 10 megawatts are operational in that country for a country that has tremendous amounts of resources, operational since the year 2014, a small wind farm in Cabreten in the Adwa region. And uh, the potential, as you can imagine, is significant. And... Uh, 
What is a little bit disappointing is to see that uh, Algeria's national program, which was announced uh, at 22 gigawatts uh, by 2030, has now been reviewed downwards at 15 gigawatts by 2020, 2035, focusing mostly on solar. So it's like uh, Algeria has kind of put aside its uh, wind ambitions and focused on solar PV, uh, and also reduce the scale of its ambition that have been announced uh, earlier. Uh, there are uh, obviously new uh, hydrogen roadmap that is published, uh, but they focus essentially on pilot projects until 2030. And uh, you know it's a mix between blue and green hydrogen. So the, the, the hydrogen does not necessarily will not necessarily come from renewables. Uh, which is not the case for a subsequent example that I'm going to conclude on, uh, which is Morocco. And the law on energy transition uh, seems to take a lot of time before uh, being implemented on renewables. And so the emission reductions targets are missed for that country. And uh, you really need to provide more changes into uh, investment uh, conditions to enable to attract new developers, which in return can prompt uh, Algeria state energy company to uh, to invest in, in renewables. So right now, uh, you really need to have a more, uh, uh, you know, a stronger uh, input from Algeria's uh, state-owned energy companies, which have, uh, as you can imagine, as a gas exporting country, a very large amount of resources, particularly in today's context. Uh, Mauritania's uh, wind energy sector is moving on, uh, moving along. Uh, obviously, uh, it's, it's a small uh, electricity uh, uh, network, I think about 500, 600 megawatts in total. And so you can imagine that comparatively speaking, 134 megawatts is still a consistent amount that is operational. Big wind farm has been uh, put online recently, the Boulin Noir, 100 megawatts. And uh, the grid expansion as well, connecting the north of the country to Senegal as well. And uh, what is interesting in Mauritania is essentially the announcements that have been made on uh, power to x projects, very large projects. And uh, what is most important now is to see how uh, uh, well integrated these projects can be within uh, within uh, Mauritania's energy electricity system and with its main industry, which is uh, iron ore export driven, which can then switch to producing uh, fossil free steel and then uh, generate local value uh, um, in Mauritania. So uh, concluding with the Morocco's uh, uh, wind energy sector, so you've got about the largest installed capacity in the region, uh, 1.5 gigawatt essentially. And uh, what's interesting to note is that this capacity will increase by about uh, one gigawatt within a year or so. And, uh, and so uh, what is also interesting is that we are already repowering uh, the first uh, wind power projects, namely uh, the first one uh, operational since 20, uh, since 2000, which has been decommissioned and will be doubled, if not quadrupled, in, in capacity in two phases. So 50 megawatts will turn into 100 megawatt uh, repowered uh, project. And this can be doubled with the sec uh, second uh, extension. Uh, interestingly enough, most of the operational capacity is on the Sahara coastline. So that's where the tremendous uh, potential is located. Uh, we have also a very large uh, integration uh, of industrial integration with Siemens being a, a large player. Uh, and uh, we've integrated the towers and the blades. Unfortunately, the blade factory has closed as a result of uh, uh, Siemens global restructuring efforts. So this is a bit of a disappointment because it was an export dedicated plant on smaller turbines for which probably the market is uh, shrinking. And uh, Morocco's target. Uh, so it's important to note that wind energy is already the second largest uh, power generating system after coal in Morocco at 13%. Gas is about uh, a little less, 
uh, than that, but you may reach uh, 13 percent and beyond. Uh, Morocco uh, has submitted enhanced uh, targets recently uh, and aims to move uh, from its current 37 percent renewable capacity in the grid to 52 percent by 2030. This can be exceeded tremendously by uh, uh, recently uh, announced projects, namely a uh, 10.5 gigawatt project linking south of Morocco to the UK, for which uh, financing has been received from the uh, Emirates, no, namely today, uh, and uh, is waiting for approval by the UK grid operator. So that's a 3.6 gigawatt, uh, 3,800 meter long, uh, kilometer long cable. And most importantly, uh, there are power to X announcements, uh, which uh, are to kick in before 2027, and they're made by the domestic uh, uh, phosphate conglomerate. So that's very promising. Uh, the operational pressure on the grid operator was obviously substituting the gas uh, imports to do to a suspension of the pipeline linking Algeria to Spain. And now Spain is sending gas in reverse flow to power our uh, gas uh, uh, gas fired power plants. Uh, intermittency has to be dealt with also with the pump storage. Morocco has now is going to uh, commission its second pump uh, storage uh, plant. And the big challenge is obviously to transfer the electricity from the sudden trade wind blown Sahara coastline to Morocco's load center, which are close to Europe's uh, load centers as well. So that looks it looks like regional uh, uh, transfer infrastructure will be uh, the solution there. Uh, so obviously the, the frameworks are conducive, the announcements are very big, and we are waiting to see uh, where these will lead. Uh, I'll conclude with uh, the announcement of uh, Morocco's phosphate conglomerate, one of the world's largest uh, fertilizer operator, phosphate leader in the world. And it basically announced that by 2027, it will process 100% of its uh, industry uh, with renewables and uh, will add uh, almost half a billion uh, cubic meter of desalination and produce uh, two, so it will be a water, freshwater uh, provider for Morocco, obviously exposed to drought, two second consecutive drought this year, and for agriculture. So we already have uh, desalination plants that feed cities, agricultures, and uh, we have a sustainable model, economically viable model to do so, provided it is uh, uh, supplied by uh, green electricity, mostly by wind. And uh, in terms of hydrogen, as we have a 70% load factor with the wind energy in the Sahara trade wind Boulogne coastline, you can add 20, 23% by solar. You have 80% essentially of, uh, of capacity factor, 80 to 90% for the green hydrogen, meaning most of the hydrogen that will be generated in Morocco to meet its targets for 2027 will be wind power generated uh, with the 2.6 gigawatt addition and 1.2 gigawatt PV uh, installation with the desalination to meet its uh, 1 million ton of uh, green ammonia targets for 2027. And these targets will be tripled by 2032. So that, that is basically uh, what is important in these announcements because uh, not only will they enable a local integration of the whole green hydrogen sector, but also scale up uh, the renewable and wind energy integration, not only locally, but uh, regionally, and perhaps also enable some uh, power exchanges with Europe. What is also interesting to note is that- Sorry, there... Philippe, you have five minutes left. Thank you. This is my last slide. And so uh, basically you have uh, uh, different options, the HVDC transfer for electrolysis on OCP's plants, and uh, the transfer by pipeline two OCP's plants uh, that are underutilized and that can be connected basically to European uh, discontinued pipelines from Algeria, providing green hydrogen, pressurized green hydrogen, and they can be stored in salt caverns, dome salt caverns, which Morocco has had uh, uh, 30 years experience in storing butane. 
and that will enable actually to do seasonal storage to power uh, Europe and North Africa's uh, industries with uh, plenty of uh, green hydrogen. And I think that this infrastructure will run in parallel with the HVDC transmission infrastructure. So I think to summarize, the energy transition is ongoing in Morocco. We need to know, uh, you know, the investments are tremendous, are beyond Morocco's uh, investment capabilities. But uh, we are confident that uh, these investments can be met. And uh, I think the same can be said about uh, Mauritania, which has a tremendous potential and an opportunity to generate uh, the processing of uh, its uh, iron ore export, I like Morocco, what Morocco is going to do with its uh, phosphate-based fertilizer and green ammonia global business. And uh, with that, I conclude my presentation, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Khalid, for not only speaking about Morocco, but uh, the whole uh, Maghreb region, which has shown some some uh, good prospects, mainly from your home country, from Morocco. But of course, we see that, of course, there, there needs to be obviously additional momentum. Now, I have a question for you uh, with regard to Morocco, because you mentioned that there is the goal of uh, exporting um, energy and at the moment I, I, my understanding is that Morocco is still an importer. What is the timeline or, or what's the threshold um, to that Morocco will become an exporter? It, wh what kind of capacity would be then uh, reached or from what capacity on so that just we get an understanding from the currently I think around 1500 megawatt and when would that be achieved? Okay, so just as a hindsight, uh, Morocco is obviously uh, importing 90% uh, of its energy needs, which are uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And uh, most uh, of Morocco's electricity, about 60%, is coal fired power plants. Uh, now, it's important to note that uh, prior to having Spain inject gas from LNG that it imports from Qatar and the US for the Moroccan markets, we were already exporting uh, electricity to Spain uh, using actually the more wind energy plants we would put online, the more, because it's intermittent, the more opportunities we have for exporting electricity to Europe, which on, a, on an uh, annual basis uh, are actually net exports, uh, accounted as net exports. So right now, uh, I think we're pretty much, if you don't count, uh, the gas imports, I think we're even, we don't export anything, and we are importing natural gas from uh, LNG terminals in Spain. And so this is just to show you that uh, we're at break even for exporting some uh, wind electricity with what's being installed because the capacity, uh, generating capacity is uh, uh, reaching a level where any additional capacity will have to be disposed of one way or another. This is why green hydrogen is very promising because uh, it will enable to absorb tremendous amounts of uh, wind capacity. The other challenge is obviously transmission of uh, that uh, wind electricity from the Sahara trade wind blown coastline to the load centers of Morocco and then, uh, and then beyond. If you do that, you can only do that with HVDC technologies, which are available only at scales of five to 10 gigawatts. So if you do that on a country that has uh, six gigawatt of peak load, you can imagine that this will involve both a large production of green hydrogen, but at the same time, big opportunity for uh, exports. So the timeline for green hydrogen has been set for 2027. That's five years from now, or four years even. And uh, that's very ambitious. Uh, but in the meantime, we do not know whether an HVDC line will be, uh, will be built. And if that is the case, then export will reach another uh, another scale because then uh, these will be uh, gigawatt uh, size uh, exports. And the objectives of adding four gigawatt by 2030 of wind will likely be uh, expanded uh, much more because if you have a line of five to 10 gigawatt, then you would want to make sure that it is fully utilized as an investment. So I understand the peak load you said is six gigawatt, and then in the next year there will be two and a half gigawatt of wind power installations. That already shows us that the uh, kind of um, domestic supply to be covered by wind in combination probably with some solar and also 
the pump uh, storage is in reach if we can if we can put it like that yeah so thank you very much uh, do we have any other questions from our audience any comments any questions so that is not the case then uh, thank you very much again and uh, of course we we look forward to hearing the good news from morocco and hopefully also from the other um, uh, countries in the in the Maghreb region soon so thank you then um we leave the african continent and we go now again to the west and it's my pleasure to welcome um, our friend and colleague Hector Pagani from Argentina, from the Argentine Wind Energy Association. Uh, Argentina, which to some degree um, has always reminded me of um, Morocco because long coastlines, strong winds, um, not such a big population. So the prospect of producing much, much more energy than the country needs by itself. We look now forward to hearing from Argentina what the status is. Um, a warm welcome, Hector Pagani, and the floor is yours. So I can already see your presentation. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar and begin able to share the state of uh, wind energy in Argentine. The installed power of February to 2023 is 43,205.8 megawatt with an installed power of renewable energy of 5,136 megawatt compared to the previous year, 57 megawatt growth. Tu fais bien. Qu'est-ce que tu fais? You understand? Yes, just there was some background noise and I muted. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, of which energy is uh, uh, 18 megawatt from the start of operation of part of the Pampa Energia 2 expansion one wind farm. It is estimated that by the end of May, 62.5 megawatt will come into operation from the wind farm. Pampa Energia 2 extension two and Arauco two, stay three and four partial. Low uh, 27,191 uh, established that Argentine by the year 2025 should have 20% renewable energy by the end of 2023, this percentage should be 18%. Reality shows that we have only 13.4% of renewable energy, where wind energy represents 18% and 71% of the renewable energy generated. In the following table, we can see the summary of the state of the wind farm. Operating part, a 58 part with 3,327 megawatt of installed power. Park under construction, 26 part with 1,411 megawatt of power. In this slide, you see the part in operation. I leave you in the presentation the status of all georeference parks as of February 
2023 so that you can explore them. Today, Argentina continues with the great problem of saturation electrical transmission line. But wind energy and other energy cannot continue to grow until this problem is solved. Until last year, tender were being carried out with priority for the dispatch of wind farm and other technology matter, renewable energy term market between private parties. The owner of the park will the park and sold its energy to private parties with contract for a certain term. By the end 2022, 34 wind farm with 1,404 megawatt of power had been asking and 19 wind farm with 730 megawatt of power had been commissioned. The last month, a uh, new matter tender was held and no one showed up. It was desert because there are no transmission lines where Argentina has high capacity factor. Due the lack of transmission line last year, the energy secretary launched the request for the report carrier manifestation of interest addressed to all those who who were interested in presenting small renewable energy project that will replace generation with fossil fuel and were in the areas where there was capacity in the transmission line. Submission were received for a total of 14 gigawatts of power and less than 90 megawatt of anti-power k gigawatt. From this request, they determined that the capacity in different provinces and carrier for tender call remedy was Buenos Aires, maximum power 10 megawatt, Cuyo Center, maximum power 30 megawatt, Northwest maximum power 140 megawatt. Kumawe maximum power 20 megawatt. In May, the proposal will be. Yesterday, the National Energy Secretary publishes a resolution relating to uncutted contract from the Renovar plan for 30 projects with 778 megawatts of power that occupied a fictitious location of transmission line and thus retender that power. Argentina has high capacity factor. The general is from 42, 50, 55 uh, percent. Buenos Aires from 40 to 60 percent. Center 30 to 55 percent. Comahue from 30 to uh, 50 percent. Northwest 25 40 percent. Patagonia from uh, 40 to 60%. And in particular, there are parts like Manantial Bear of 70.6% in December 2022, Costen 70%, and Garajalde 68%. Thank you 
for your time. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias uh, por su presentación. Um, I'm impressed by those numbers that you presented at the end, because we sometimes hear uh, from high capacity factors of 50% or 60, but 70% that really sounds like a world record. Um, I'm not sure whether anybody is keeping such uh, records, but uh, maybe we should do that. And congratulations anyway for this. Thank you. So um, it's good to see that uh, there is also uh, development, there is momentum in Argentina. And I understand that uh, similar like uh, what others have mentioned from other countries, that uh, one bottleneck for you is in the grid infrastructure, that, that is uh, further grid uh, um, extension required to develop more wind farms. So that uh, next to the uh, challenge with uh, the permission processes seem to be two of the major problems um, that we see obviously all over the world. So I would like to now ask uh, again, whether we have any questions or final comments. We're coming now to the end of this webinar. Um, and so feel free to now make any more general comments also, if you would like to do so. So this seems not to be the case. So I think we've had really excellent speakers who explained very well uh, what the uh, situation is in their countries, what the main challenges are. Um, we've heard, let me just uh, repeat, we've heard in our first, se first session, um, we've heard from Australia, from China, from Japan, from India, from Pakistan, we heard from Ukraine, from Turkey, we heard from Sweden and Germany, we heard from uh, Egypt, Morocco and other Maghreb countries, we heard from Canada, from United States, Brazil and Argentina. So I think really we've covered uh, most of the uh, most dynamic markets and uh, the message is We've could uh, we we heard from many of our colleagues here is that yes, wind power is moving. There is an acceleration. There is a lot of investment happening. There are some barriers. I just mentioned them. Uh, one of them, obviously, the permitting processes duration is too long. They are still obviously too complicated. Um, there is still a challenge with well, what some people call public acceptance, and I see some correlation here, because obviously places where there is a strong community engagement process in place, these things take not that long because they're of, of less opposition, but more inclusion as kind of the opposite of uh, uh, opposition inclusion. We hear from grid, uh, um, limited grid access or connection to the grid that in some cases as we heard is certainly uh, on the the kind of grid infrastructure on the high voltage level but we also know that on the distributed side so we certainly need more investment on the grid side so that the the, the electricity produced from wind power um, can also be distributed um, to the consumers where the electricity is needed. With this, I would say we come to the end of this webinar. I'm pleased again that we were able to give you an overview first and information. I'm very grateful to all our speakers, say a big thank you. A big thank you also to the, uh, the partner of our webinar series, Profic Ventus, the company. You find the link to them on our website. And now I have the pleasure to hand over for the concluding remarks, final words, and to officially close the event to Peter Ray. Thank you very much. And Stefan, I think that uh, everyone would agree that you've done a very good job in uh, introducing 
and commenting and uh, making the webinar a very impressive review of what's happening around the world. I think uh, we need to say thank you to you and thank you to Martina uh, for the work that she has done in uh, organizing the technical side of this uh, webinar. So thank you to all of the uh, people who have done the work in producing the presentations which we've heard uh, today, over the day. And uh, thank you to those people who have, uh, without presentation, joined in and listened to. I think we're all much better informed than we were uh, when this started. And uh, I hope that what it means is that we're on our way to being having a rapid increase in the rate at which renewable energy and particularly wind is being developed around the world. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and this is the end of uh, the very impressive webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. And as usual, and as I indicated before, you can listen to the recordings on our YouTube channel in a couple of days.